All right. Hello, everybody. This is James Stanley with Daily Effects. Just want to thank you very much for your time in advance. So started off with gold. We're going to end up there, but really wanted to start off with USD because, well, it finally happened. It finally, finally happened. I'm going to go over to a different chart, though. There we go. This one. It broke below that confluent batch of huge support that held this thing up from that September inflection. Now, not only that, and I think this is what really bakes into a very interesting cake here on USD. We had that downside run that held throughout the summer. We caught that very sudden pivot and reverse right off of that confluent area of support in September. That produced a big bullish candle for the month of September. Month of October, very much a sutter step. Notice we built in this, I could go either way. It could be an inverted hammer, it could be a dragonfly doji. Depending on who you ask, it's a relatively tight candle body up here, which is why I'd be accepting of either term. But I'm approaching this more closer, closely similar to a dragonfly doji. And then last month, heels of the election, strong, very decisive theme of USD weakness. I guess that was oxymoronic, a strong theme of weakness. But it was an aggressive move of weakness on the back of the US presidential election. I mean, this thing, there you go. You can see where we had that flicker on November 4th, the morning after the election. And it's been mostly pain ever since. So drawing back to that monthly chart, we did just get, as of yesterday, confirmed closure of an evening star formation on the monthly chart of USD, combined with a support breach. To my eyes, it's, it lines this up for a bearish bias in USD. Now, if you attend these webinars with regularity, you'll probably know that I make a concerted effort to remain balanced on the matter. I rarely want a full boat of entirely long or short USD scenarios or setups. Today, it's going to be incredibly hard for me to look in any other direction because we did just get this very recent breakout. Now, a key point of consideration is this breakout is still really young, very new, very fresh. Uh, it, it's not quite yet something to write home about, but the area that we are taking out, I mean, it's huge, it's enormous, but it draws, does draw some attention to this. Economic calendar, we are not done with this week yet. As a matter of fact, we're not even done for today. Uh, we get Charlie Evans speaking here in a little bit, about three o'clock this afternoon. Uh, we've already heard from Ms. Daly of the San Francisco Fed. Uh, Madam Lagarde spoke a little earlier today. Uh, Governor Lowe out of Australia speaks a little later tonight. But perhaps more importantly than that, go out the rest of the week, and, and we still do have quite a bit to contend with um, tomorrow and thereafter. So like tomorrow, for instance, we're getting more and more of this Fed speak, Quarles, Williams, uh, more Powell testimony, Patrick Harker. The Powell testimony today, I mean, this served to really punch USD. That's what ultimately helped to, uh, to bring on that break. Uh, he spoke at 10 a.m. today. Case in point, look at that big bearish move that finally took out the support that had played in yesterday. Well, that was at 10 a.m. It was right on the back of those Powell comments. He doesn't sound as optimistic as what uh, equity markets appear to be voicing. Um, uh, Williams out of the New York Fed, Beige Book, a little later on tomorrow. Thursday, also quite a bit going on. But Friday, we get the big one, non-farm payrolls, NFP, 8.30 in the morning. Um, so we're not out of the woods yet. There's still a lot of USD drivers there. If you look at this on a shorter term basis, we basically have the prospect of chasing a fresh breakout. That could be a pretty nasty thing to be working with. So for those that are looking for USD weakness, a couple of points of reference here. Uh, if I drill down to the hourly chart, you can see where there's a, a attempt to build some support here right around like 9130. Notice where we have these uh, underside wick covers underneath that 9130 spot. Quick test below. Another test, test that finishes with strength. So we may be seeing a short-term bottoming effect taking place in USD. So this really just opens the door for a couple of shorter-term resistance points that might come into play. 91.50 is a big level. That's what helped us set the low yesterday. Go up a little bit higher. There's a possible area right here at 91.60. I'm not going to include that because I really only have that one point of touch. I want to get these as synced as I can or as synced as possible at least, but notice there was this gap in here. Right in there, a small gap, but that relates pretty similarly to this resistance reaction. So I want to color that whole zone, that whole area. Uh, I'm going to take it down to that candlestick body as uh, an R2. 
right in there. I'm basically just gonna try to sync it up with that pre-gap area. Uh, and then a little bit higher, we have the big spot of confluent Fibonacci levels, like 91, 92, 91, 93. Uh, this is the same zone that came into play, again, early September. Up to arrest those declines, gave us a month of strength that dissipated over the next month and a half. Now we have that fresh two-year low. Be real hard not to chase these false breakouts or not to chase a fresh breakout. But, you know, again, I think just trying to attain some semblance of balance, even when it doesn't feel right, could be the way to go because every trader in the world has access to this chart. Every big bank knows the USD just punched down to fresh two-year lows. If they were going for the jugular, it already would have happened. We already would have seen that selling come into the equation. And this breakout on the monthly chart, daily chart, weekly chart, I mean, they would likely uh, seem as more profuse if these moves were a given, and they're not. It looks like we're waiting on data for the remainder of the week. We're waiting on some Fed commentary to see if there is going to be some continuation potential there. Uh, now, with that said, the first chart that I opened up this webinar with is one that does bring a bit of excitement on the short side of USD. That's gold. Gold was in a nasty four-month stretch. Let's go ahead and go off that chart. I know it's pretty busy. We'll get a little bit tighter so that it's not as busy. There we go. Daily chart. So I remember it was in these webinars earlier this summer when I was talking about the other side of gold, and there was there was nary a bear in sight. Like if we go back to early August price action, it kind of feels like Bitcoin feels today, where there's really only one supported side of the argument that I could see out there in financial markets, or at least from people talking about financial markets. And you know, I remember I was uh, uh, trying to look at the flip side of gold back here, and a lot of folks in the room, why would you look at getting short gold? Well, because it got massively overbought. It stayed massively overbought for a long time. Got overbought here in July, continued to run. It wasn't until August 7th that the other side of this started to fill in. And you'll notice that on the daily chart, the same exact day, the gold prices set that fresh all-time high at 2075. That was a Friday. But that day ended with a bearish engulf. Bearish engulfing patterns are often going to be followed with continuation potential. That's precisely what happened. The next week when this thing opened, that previously profuse bull market spilled over with aggression. Gold prices got rid of $200 like that. Support built in in this confluent area, 1859 to 1871. And for the next three months, did a really good job of helping to hold the lows. Now, what makes this a little bit more surprising is the backdrop with which it happened. Because again, we're looking at that three month sequence in USD where it A, strengthened to September, B, stalled in October, C, sold off with aggression in November. Now, gold is often going to be inversely related. I don't want to call it correlated because the correlation isn't that tight, but will be inversely related uh, between gold and USD. So if we get USD weakness, often we'll see gold strength because at the end of the day, gold is priced in USD. That's another way of expressing the gold quote. XAU, USD. Gold is priced in USD. So if the dollar gains, then usually gold will go down. So this move in September makes a lot of sense. Rational. Dollar was really strong. Gold pulled back, tested support. October, again, USD was just kind of treading water. And it's somewhat similar. Somewhat similar in gold. November is where the proverbial lot thickened. Because not only do we have that aggressively weak US dollar, we started to see a really weak gold spot. That weakness lasted all the way into yesterday. Prices fell all the way down to the 764 retracement of that summer bullish breakout. Now, after that level came into play, we started to see strength filter through. Now we have a test of short-term resistance around 18, 17, thereabouts. I think what's really exciting about this is to look at the correlation or the relationship between the two. Uh, so what you're seeing here, uh, top, this is just the gold spot, um, building this off a longer term chart. But below, this is correlation with, with USD, DXY specifically. It's correlation with US dollar. So you'll notice there's a general penchant for a negative correlation here. There are brief blips of direct correlation 
but that's certainly the exception versus the rule. You'll notice that that just happened again. And it's explained by that month of November, in which both gold and USD were extremely weak. But if we look at this on a short-term basis, specifically focusing in on what's happened today, we started to see that inverse relationship it's starting to come back a little bit. Let's go down a little tighter for our, there we go, where you see it moderating off of that direct relationship. So zero is no relation, plus one is a perfect direct correlation. Negative one is a perfectly inverse correlation, where if the dollar is down 1%, gold is up 1%. Well, we're getting closer to that inversion again. And if we look at this on the hourly, just focusing solely on today's price action, that inverse relationship is back. So that's the exciting part of this breakdown in USD to me. It also helps to allude into strategy. If I am looking for a continuation of dollar weakness, maybe looking back on the long side of gold, it's one of the ways to do that. You know, this isn't the first time that gold's had one of these prolonged periods of digestion. It's not even the first time it's had one of these in this, this most recent bullish cycle. If you remember, it was back in Q4 2018, I started talking up alongside of gold, uh, largely on the basis of a offhand comment from Jerome Powell, saying that the neutral rate was a long way off, widely inferred to mean that the Fed had plans for many more rate hikes in 2019 and thereafter, of course, they didn't, they ended up cutting. But notice here, in February of 2019, lasting until May of 2019. I mean, so we're talking a full three months. Gold prices are building in this falling wedge pattern before ultimately triggering higher. Then that gives us a quick two, two and a half, three months of gains. And then we get another four plus months of digestion from September all the way into December. We even had that knee jerk reaction back here. Remember in March as Corona, as uh, COVID is getting priced into the situation, Gold prices got punched by 15%. 14.97 to be exact. There it is, 14.9%. That was in a week. March 9 top, March 16th low. More than 14.9% 4 in a week. So, I'm not massively deterred from... The now four months of digestion that we've had in gold prices off that August 7th top, notice it's lost about 14.96% from peak to trough, which is not out of band for what we saw just in a week in March. On a near-term basis, the big question is going to be whether bulls can continue to drive the ship. And, and we're at that first test, getting back up to that resistance level that it held a couple of different highs last week. But notice we have some pretty concerted buying behavior here even as USD has started to stall over the past couple of hours. And so this is going to remain as one of my more attractive short side USD scenarios. Look for strength to come back in gold, largely just trying to play that bigger picture, longer term theme that has continued with a cyclical type of, type of quality behind it. Uh, ultimately, what helped, it, helped to hold this thing up? There's a couple of different Fibonacci levels in really tight proximity, but we, we pivoted right at the 50 Fib of the March to August major move. I'm still as bullish as I was back in August, maybe even more so because back in August, we were hot to trot and way overbought. Now we've pulled back, cauterized some support. And I don't know that there's many projections that we're gonna see any faster than expected rate hikes out of these central banks anytime soon. I know there was a quick blip of hope in the 10 year. Uh, and that's basically been a theme that's been fairly pronounced ever since COVID vaccine news came into the equation a couple of weeks ago, a few weeks ago. But that's still a theme that I'd be very comfortable in looking to fade at this point. And uh, Long Gold, I think, is one, one, one venue to voice that theme. All right, now with that being said, that's not the only thing going on across FX markets now. Uh, so again, USD is punched down to that fresh two-year low. Correspondingly, Euro dollar has finally broken the range, pushed above that 120 spot. When I get one of these items, it's... I think I'm going to approach this much more conservatively than most folks will, because basically the theme that I was looking to hold, which was the range continuation, it's now nullified. As highlighted by that breakout to fresh two drops. 
two and a half year highs. So at this point, I simply need to reassess. I need to wait. If this breakout continues, if bulls continue to drive, then it's going to be a lot easier for me to flip onto the long side of this thing. At this point, the only way I would have for really hitting the long side is going down to like the hourly. Notice in this wick cover that we have up top at around 2050 and looking for that to prelude a pullback that could open the door for a support test around that prior point of resistance at the 120 spot. But I think that's where the rubber is going to hit the road. Because if we see this thing at 119.95 and bulls don't pounce for perceived bargain or value, then I'm going to look at this move a lot more suspect than I would otherwise. That's the first big test. Can buyers retain support 120 or above? I'm willing to take a quick flicker below, but I want to see him respond. If I got a candlestick close on the hourly, four hour or daily, that's going to be a lot less convincing than if I see that 120 price continue to hold support in Euro, keeping the door open for some bullish continuation ahead of that ECB meeting in a week and a half. That ECB meeting is next Thursday. The bank is widely expected to increase their stimulus outlay. Even with that wide expectation, your dollar is breaking out with aggression today. So this might be a theme of markets trying to call the ECB's bluff, expecting the ECB to come in with an underwhelming package. It would not be out of the norm. The ECB has disappointed multiple times before. It could certainly happen again. So maybe this is the market calling that bluff a week ahead of time. I don't know. But from a technical basis, what keeps us clean is a pullback to find support at that 120 spot. If it doesn't hold, I'm going to have to remain in a relatively passive mode until this thing cleans itself up and I get a better feel for what's actually going on. That is your dollar. Cable. So this has been my short side USB candidate for a bit now, and I just got to stick with it um, because largely it has continued to hold above that prior point of key resistance. That prior point of key resistance is really multifold. 132.50 up to 32.75. That was a big zone right back here. But notice we did flicker up to that 133 spot before reversing. Test of 133 again, which is why it exists on my chart. After we broke above, we had a quick flicker down to the 32.50, 32.75 zone, but multiple recurrent support hits off that 33 level. As this thing was basically just range banging back and forth for a couple of weeks there, latter half of November. Well, at this point, we're breaking out here too. I don't like the idea of chasing this at a fresh high, same way that I don't like the idea of chasing Euro dollar at a fresh high. The resistance or the wick cover on top of near-term price action, it's not as imposing, but I'm similarly gonna wait for this thing to pull back before I even start thinking about the long side of this again. Uh, now, with that said, given that we do have a fresh breakout, there is the prospect of some higher low support around that 134 spot. I'm probably going to look at that from around 133.97 from that swing right there up to this swing right here on 134.08. So I'll call that 11 pip zone. I might as well just draw it on while I'm at it. Little 11 pip zone. See if I can play some pullback action there. So that'd be a very similar type of theme as Euro without 120 spot. But if that doesn't hold, no problem. I'm just going to delete that off my chart and follow that same 133 level that's been doing a pretty good job of helping to cauterize support so far in cable. But I'm looking at both those on the short side of the dollar right now, uh, largely because of the fresh breakouts that we have. So this is an item that gets a little bit more interesting on the long side of the dollar. You know, again, the dollar is, is disgustingly weak right now. It's perilously difficult to call a bottom. At this point, I'm merely trying to fill in something that can balance my boat because I don't want to take a punt on all short side USD setups after a fresh breakout to two year lows. That just seems unprofessional to me. One area that could be a little bit more enticing on the long side of the dollar is here in Aussie. And I really got to read between the lines to, to, to dignify this. Okay. Now, one of the items is buyers for whatever reason, are frightened of 74.12, or they have been so far. 74.12 is the high water mark that came into play in September, you know, right as USD was bottoming. Uh, that's when your dollar put in its 120 test. We're above that level now. But notice, yesterday, bears, or bulls really came close to taking it out before bears took over. When bears took over, they gave us a bearish engulf. 
Very similar to what I showed you on gold August 7th when that thing topped out. Bearish and golf usually approach with the aim of bearish continuation. Uh, the, the quandary that we have at this moment is that bearish and golf stopped right at support taken from prior resistance. And thus far today, that USD weakness has led to a bounce. There you can see the build of that support. Can't fault bearish for lack of trying. But at this stage, we still do have a technical lower high, a failure to break above the prior high, a very adequate requisite reason as to why this bounce has developed. Support as taken from prior resistance, again, at a very random level, 7340, but whatever. And then if I want to read between the lines, those for sellers, they've, they've kind of marked their line in the sand around the 7370, 7375 area. All right, so this could give me some scope for looking at something that might keep the door open for long side USD scenarios. Look at a short side Aussie. And if I wanted to hedge that off or wanted to hedge off some of that USD risk, Kiwi dollar might be an interesting companion for that setup as this one's just continued to tear away. While we have that false high or that, uh, that lower high in Aussie below the September swing high, notice what we do not have happening in Kiwi. This thing has just been large and in charge since the November open uh, uh, with, a, with a super consistent uptrend. So this might be something if I didn't want to take that long USD, that short Aussie risk, I could possibly wash off some of that USD risk here and creating a, synth, uh, uh, a synthetic cross between Aussie key. Let's go down a little bit tighter. There we go. Notice we've got that same kind of wick cover taking place here. Looks a little extended, a little stretched. Uh, 70 so far has held big. Notice how when we broke above, even we pulled back, buyers, they stepped in before 70 retest. This is very similar to what I'd like to see on Euro with respect to that 120 level. You know, now it's going to be a little tougher to try to uh, try to bake into that position, but uh, it seems as though there's a comfortable little spot to look for prices to pull back towards around 70.43. It could be like a, a very close area of support potential. Um, now, just to marry these two themes together, in essence, what I'm trying to do is to create a synthetic cross here to take advantage of the exposure from the short side trend while also um, you know, largely harnessing it around USD, looking for a quick run of USD weakness or strength to more than obviate the other side of the hedge or the other side of the scenario. So if I take a stop on one piece, I want the target on the other piece to more than pay for that stop and then some, right? So that way, if the dollar flies or dies, I don't care. I got something that works. Um, in that scenario, on the short side of USD, Kiwi dollar looks a little bit more attractive. And I just showed you that Kiwi dollar chart a moment ago. And here we have Aussie key, defined trend since that September open. Uh, Kiwi uh, has been significantly stronger than Aussie. And on the long side of the dollar, Aussie. That could be one possibly risk efficient way to play for USD strength or a USD bounce without necessarily having to carry the entire bag. All right. Um, okay, got a couple more minutes. I don't want to start taking some questions. As usual, let me know what's on your mind. I'll answer as many of these as I possibly can. This is something else I could actually keep on the long side of the dollar. And, uh, you know, this is largely a scenario of deduction because as we have USD punching down to that fresh low, uh, CAD's not playing that game, right? There's a September low, which we slightly breached yesterday. But even as USD is spilling down today, notice what dollar cat is not doing. It just nudged below that 2950 level. It's been a pretty tough nut to crack. And it's just kind of stalled or held there. If we do get that USD reversal theme, then the CAD weakness has helped to offset that USD move today. It's something that could be advantageous for me. Let's go down even tighter hourly. There we go. Right, you see a similar build of support. The difference here is that we're at a familiar spot on the chart, whereas USD is at that fresh low, right? So this would be another way of looking the long side of the dollar. You know, trying to pull some of these prevailing themes from other currencies in the pair to allow for some strategy potential. All right, I have an article that's about to hit in five minutes. As soon as that hits, I'm gonna show you the, uh, I'm gonna show you the hero or the headline on our site so that uh, you can, Check it out as well if you'd like. All right, dollar Swiss. This is another one that 
challenging, but there hasn't been much for life below 90 in Swissy of late, right? I mean, we did test below early November, albeit briefly, and we bounced right back. We're testing, we're, we're getting close to another test there today. But this would basically just be a scenario of psychological support defense off the 90 handle. This is another one I can keep on the long side of the dollar and one that I can help to wash off some USD risk and say like a euro dollar setup or something along those lines. Uh, Karan asks, uh, double bottom for me? No, it's, there's already been a couple of lows around this area. One there, one there. I mean, if anything, I would probably be drawing this up more as a descending triangle. You know, taking this little action. Mine with that support around the 90 handle. There we go. So I take that more as like a descending triangle type of formation than I would in just a pure double bottom. But another way where I can look to work with long side USD, even though it's been you know an absolutely putrid backdrop there in the US dollar. Right, that, my friends, is what I have on the currency side of the situation. Um, I'm going to start looking at a few other markets. And like I said, ask me your questions. Got a good amount of time for Q&A today, I believe. Um, gold. So like I said a little earlier, this is one of the more attractive scenarios for short side USD for me. The big question I have is whether or not we're at that point where bulls are ready to take over again. You know, the fact that this came back to life on the heel of those Powell comments earlier this morning, you know, again, those were at 10 a.m. You know, we focus in. 10 a.m. to look what happened. And 10 a.m. we had a pretty good pivot. You know, prices started to reverse, not 0900. But 10, when Powell started speaking, that's when bulls came back, helped set support, eventually push it back up, fresh near term high, re encountering that, that prior zone of resistance. Uh, there are a couple of possible speed bumps ahead. Uh, let's draw for this chart first. Uh, got a FIBO level, 1836. I didn't get much support action on the way down at that level. I was considering this like a full zone. If I cut down to the four hour, I, could, I mean, it's a little bit on the four hour, like there's that one quick flicker of a wick, November 23rd, but that's not really much to write home about. Um, the level that did substantiate more support is the longer term FIBO study. And I'm taking this from that Q4 2018 low, well, actually August 2018 low, drawing that up to the August 2020 high. But that 23.6 FIBO at 1859 is right there. This one did a really good job of holding the lows over a couple of different occasions. This helped to catch that spike low from the August pullback. Another iteration here, and there was actually some decent grind over like a four day sequence. Notice where sellers continually tried to pull below, buyers pushed it back, pull, push, pull, push, pull, push. Came back another round here, late October. Uh, even in the backdrop of the election. That was the COVID vaccine news, uh, the Pfizer COVID vaccine news. Even held through that. You know, uh, it wasn't until last week this thing got smashed and, and hasn't been back there since. But if we do uh, you know, see bulls coming back into the equation, that is definitely a level of possible resistance when we back up. It was you know, a very key zone of support that helped to define the lows during that digestion period. Uh, a little bit higher, there is a big zone here, 1927, 1943. And then, of course, we've got the 1900 big figure on the way. So a couple of different uh, possible areas of resistance on the way back up. Yeah, I would have a hard time substantiating the short side of this at the moment. But uh, stocks. So I'm pretty cautious here, probably more cautious than what a lot of other folks are. Um, the troubling thing to me is here. So that was the day that the COVID vaccine news came out, the Pfizer COVID vaccine news came out. This is when the Moderna vaccine news came out. Uh, 23rd, we had the AZN news come out. You know what hasn't happened? We haven't yet eclipsed the spike in that initial rush of excitement. So like day one, we get the Pfizer news. This thing spiked up, fresh ATH. And then it falls back and we haven't taken it out since. As a matter of fact, I mean, I can arguably make the case 
the news has been increasingly positive ever since then. Because all we had there was one report of 95% efficacy or 90% efficacy. Here we had a report of 95% efficacy with a second drug. And we even had a third drug here on November 23rd from AZN. So like collectively, we, now we have three chances for a vaccine. One with a 90% efficacy turned out to be 94.1. Another with a 95% efficacy. And then the AZN which has a study that's shrouded in mystery, but I'll leave that one to the side. But in the face of this seemingly increasingly positive news, the S&P has not been able to yet take out that high. A market that doesn't rally on good news, let's call it great news, something's up. I don't know what, but something's up. You know, today, again, Powell talked up cheap money. Biden ruled out his economic team, bringing Janet Yellen back into the fold. All positive, optimistic factors. Yet we're still not able to leave that prior high behind. Another item of disconcert on that front. After the COVID vaccine news started to come into the equation, one of those observations was return of value. Right? As noted in the Dow Jones Industrial Average, case in point, the Dow did not make a fresh all-time high until that COVID vaccine news came into the equation. Right? This was the one lagging index of the major American U.S. Uh, indices, well, the three major large cap American U.S. equity indices. They refused to, to test that prior all-time high in the COVID backdrop. But once we had the vaccine news, this thing popped above, set that fresh all-time high, and this all of a sudden, which was the laggard in the COVID backdrop, became the leader. The prior leader of the NASDAQ, well, that became the laggard. There was a very requisite explanation for why that was the case, because a lot of people were saying, well, with COVID vaccine, we got a faster than expected return to normal, less work from home. So all of these companies like Zoom and Netflix and Chipotle and Google that have profited massively off of shutdowns or business closures or work from home, these companies are now coming under a little bit of pressure while the developed large chip, blue, uh, large cap blue chip companies that constitute the Dow that will largely benefit off of a quote unquote return to normal. You know, we're talking like the Boeings of the world. Well, now there's an extra reason to get even more bullish on them because we're going to have a faster than expected return to normal. That hasn't played through. As a matter of fact, if you look today, now the NASDAQ is trying to retake the crown as the leader of the American U.S. equity indices. We're back up to that all-time high. Back to what had been a pretty tough couple of weeks in the backdrop of that COVID vaccine news. Now, I don't want to get too deep on analysis of the virus because I'm not a virologist, nor am I going to pretend to be one on the internet. But what I will say is that in all three of these indices, given the news that we had in November, I would have the expectation that we would see greater bullish behavior as backed by a super accommodative Fed, almost a uniform dovish response from global central banks, and now the prospect of a vaccine. It just hasn't played through yet. The question I have is why? It seems very similar to what was going down in February when stocks started to show a little bit of pressure before the big bearish theme had come in later in the month to price in COVID in the first place. So this is not an area where I want to chase stocks. If you look at the Dow weekly chart, we have that wick cover inside of the 30K level and buyers have not been able to yet leave that behind. There may be some bearish scenarios in the not too distant future. And that, my friends, is what I have for today. I want to see what kind of questions ladies and gentlemen have. Let me know what's on your mind. Uh, from Quran, cable resistance beyond current highs, potential levels to watch for uh, resistance, please. Of course, of course, happy to help. All right, so this one gets a little bit messy. Let me just clean this up a bit. All right, so, I mean, there's a pretty big barrier, 135. And that's basically been the two-year high. It kind of scared folks back in August. We got close to couldn't quite test it, but 135 is the major one beyond that. I think that if we're going to take out 135 in one swing, we're going to need a heck of a driver to do it. You know, maybe something Brexit related. I don't know, but you know, that's a big, huge, enormous level. If we're going to take that out, we're going to need something to really do some pushing. 
Um, you know, a USD breakdown could do it too, but you know, I struggled to project what might actually create that. You know, US dollar is already pretty weak. Fed's already pretty stretched. So I'm going to leave my answer at 135 because that is far and away the big level um, setting above current price action. And, and I don't think that we'll get a, a, a straight up break through that without at least some type of pressure coming back into the equation. I'm going to see if I can pull anything else nearby. Yeah, like that's a big zone. I mean, that's all the way up to 143. 3850, again, pretty stretched, pretty far away. Nothing immediately obvious. 3715, even that's pretty far away. All right, all right so I'm going to have to kind of, kind of stretch here, but 3658 might have something. That was a quick swing high back September 2017. I got no follow through confirmation of that level though. Uh, this is the one that I'd probably feel pretty good about because there was at least some drive around that level, like 37.65. 140 is pretty major. And then this is another one that's pretty obvious, 42.75 to like 43 thereabouts. Um, Alessandro Antonio Filippi, uh, hello and welcome. Now, hi, I'm new to Daily Effects and we're very glad to have you on the site. Um, but I've been an IG client for a while now. I've seen a lot of your analysis involving uh, trend line support, resistance levels, and FIB. Do you find markets respect these? So if you ask 10 different technical analysts, you're likely going to get 10 different answers. <laughs> I hate to say it like that, but it's a very subjective type of science. Here's my opinion. I do not believe that levels drawn on the chart predict the future. Point blank, I do not. But that said, I think in an absence of drivers, we'll often see technical items create motivation to fill those in. Case in point, your dollar. So I'm going to go with just a real general, probably the least, the, the, the least threatening um, support and resistance mechanism that I have in my repertoire. That's psychological levels. Psychological levels just rounded even whole numbers like 120. 125, 115, et cetera. There's nothing special about these. These are just rounded, even levels. So when I teach this, I have a tendency to see a lot of folks just kind of dismiss it out of hand. Like, that can't work. That's stupid. Well, there's a reason that practically every retailer, every large retailer on planet Earth uses pricing conventions that end in increments of 99, 99 cents, 99p to make things seem cheaper. The price of a dollar and one cent seems a lot more than two cents more expensive than 99 cents. 99 cents, oh, it's not even a buck. Dollar one, ooh, hold up. It's really just 2% more. But as human beings, we can't help it. We think that way. Oddly, that same behavioral observation has a tendency to play itself out in markets. Case in point, look what happened here in Euro dollar. I mean, that was a strong surging trend that we had from November 17 to January 18. And buyers were large and in charge. They tested above this 125 handle. But once we got above 125, it just seemed more expensive. And so buyers started to slow down and then prices pulled back. And then the next week we did the same, tested above 125. But at this point, there are even fewer buyers, maybe even more sellers. And notice we got that lower high another respect of 125. And then the next week, we even saw that weakness play through. But once we pulled back to 2250, a lot of the folks that were long over at 24 said, you know what, well, your dollars pulled back. We got another run at 125 coming up. And we did. Same thing played out though. As soon as this got above 125, it felt a lot more expensive than when it was 124.99. And sure enough, buying pressure slows down. Sellers start to come in. We evaporate some of those gains. And then lo and behold, we couldn't even test that level again because the next time we got up to 2490, sellers were like, you know what? I'm not even going to wait. Hit the short. Bang the offer. And that's exactly what happened. And then lo and behold, that selling pressure, it took weeks to play out. That resistance inflection took like three months to ultimately bring on sellers. But would you know what happened? Price go right back down and do the same thing on the other side of 115. 
And again, it held for a couple of weeks through a few tests, led to a couple of bounces. We even penetrated it for a little bit, but we ended up coming right back. And right back as resistance. Now, as I said a little earlier, I think technical criteria have a tendency to play out more often in an absence of drivers, which is what brings us to today. So this theme, it still kind of plays out. There's that 125 spot your dollar we were looking at a moment ago. A lot of stuff going on at 115. 120 came into play in September. Right, same deal. Life above 120, it seems a lot more expensive than life below 120. And it changed the entire flow in the pair. So 120 came back into the equation yesterday. Same deal. We touched it. And then we reversed, we reversed by like 75 pips. But then we had that PAL commentary today. It made folks think maybe there's a higher probability of continued USD weakness on the back of a really dovish Fed. And that finally is what gave this thing the legs to break above that 120 handle. So to my mind, this is a pretty good synopsis of how a market respects a support or resistance level. And when it doesn't, when there's a driver, when there's a reason, to bring buyers in to obviate the resistance that's already held, then prices are gonna break out, but it's not predictive in any way. The reason this is important to me is when I see that resistance inflection, that's an area where I could look to risk a dollar to try to make two. And that to me is what's more important because I'm never gonna know the future and I don't wanna to expect to, I don't wanna to try to, but I can use my analysis to find little inflections, little wedges, little areas, where risk management could be more attractive than others. Now, you asked about a few other mechanisms here. I know I just defaulted to psychological levels because it's the most simple one to chart, ex explain, and show. Uh, as far as, say, like Fibonacci, of course, Fibonacci is not going to be as widespread, right? Because psychological levels, this is something that impacts every human being. It's a behavioral uh, kind of conundrum. Fibonacci, I mean, heck, pretty much only advanced chartists are going to know how to use Fib by and large. So there's automatically going to be fewer people that are seeing it. But you know, with that said, I don't know that it necessarily means that it's less valuable in any way. You know, I showed that gold setup a little earlier, but this can play out in a number of different ways. Now, again, I don't think it's because Fibonacci levels have any like magical qualities behind it. And I think, you know, a, a big portion of this stuff is Know, maybe not quite fate or faith, but you know, looking at those little pockets of opportunity to possibly risk a dollar in the effort of making two. So I drew a Fibonacci retracement here on the long-term monthly euro dollar chart. This is what I call the lifetime move, the 2000 low to the 08 high. But you'll notice there are a number of inflections taking place at the Fibonacci intervals on this chart. Go down a little tighter and you'll see quite a bit more. It's not perfect. Right, but like there's a, a a very attractive resistance inflection late December of last year, and then as COVID was getting priced into the situation, it didn't care the resistance was there. It spikes above, falls below, uh, finds it for resistance on the way up, resistance on the way down. But this was basically just a pause point. This was an excuse to slow things down, a speed bump, if you will. That's because there's a much more pressing theme at the time. But there are other instances where it did work really well. But that's just one fibo. On the same chart, I could drop a couple of additional ones that'll give me some extra context. And then that, plus say like some psychological levels, give me a, a pretty good outing of horizontal support and resistance on my chart. There's also a trend line in here. Uh, if you do a, use that to kind of explain, there we go. So there's also a trend line. Now, the way I see it, trend lines are even more subjective because there's not even like a uniform way of drawing these. Well, some people teach two points of touch. I teach three. Otherwise, it just seems like it's connected to random spots on a chart to me. But even this situation, right? There's definitely an area of resistance coming to play here, 3874. But which of these do I want to draw the high to if I use this one? Well, there's no third point of touch to confirm its usage. If I use this one, well, I have that third point of touch, but it's a little bit messy. Not only that, it didn't really help me much on this instance, right? I just got that third point of touch and then it was kind of bonk. 
So I use some trend lines, not as big of a fan of those. Uh, FIB, I use heavily, but usually in conjunction with other support and resistance mechanisms. And what's really attractive to me is when I find confluence between Fibonacci levels taken from multiple studies. Case in point, what I had happening right here, around 111.87 up to 112.12, big, big zone. I got a FIBO level from both of those studies that I just drew on a longer term chart. And sure enough, helps to slow the move on the way up, helps to set support on the pullback. That's not the first time that area was in order either. That uh, inflection we saw back here, November of 18, went down right there at that confluence spot on the chart. So for me, it's it's really about kind of trying to get a feel for it. I'll plot a few different mechanisms. I'll look for which ones have had uh, the most inflections. I, I'll use that as data to kind of confirm or deny its usability. But at the end of the day, nothing predicts, predicts what's going to happen tomorrow. The benefit of support and resistance is helping to identify where I could risk a dollar or try to make two. Because if I'm looking to get, say, get long USD, and I wanted to do that against the euro, and I was looking at that setup to, uh, yesterday from that 120 resistance inflection, and I say, well, if resistance is going to hold, I want to remain in the trade, but if resistance breaks, I want to get out. That's the benefit behind support and resistance. It allows me to implement an if-then statement. And then if it breaks, then I know I'm wrong. I know I have no business being in a short position any longer as this thing's breaking out to fresh two-year highs. So that makes life a little easier for me and helping to define the approach, to find the strategy, uh, context with which uh, I could follow the market, if you will. But unfortunately, nothing predicts what's going to happen tomorrow. I wish it did, but it's not the case. Um, Martian Shijeki, pound key. CAD key, please. Oh, these are two crosses. I don't do a lot with, but let me see what I can find. Pound key. This one was my trade of the year from like five or six years ago. <laughs> it's funny the way that they play out. These are my targets. And it took years, but they ultimately filled in. But uh, let's see here. Yeah, I wouldn't want to fade that Kiwi strength here against Sterling. We're getting a trend. I mean, it did, you know, it, it, a four-hour chart, so looking at a decent amount of data. It did trickle down for a while after breaking that support. You know, now it's uh, price actually begun to equalize and test right above that 190 level. So, yeah, I think that this this could have some allure on the short side, a couple of different ways to focus on it. One is the 190 level, major psych level in play right now. If we could see some continued defense of that level, that might be an open door to look at the short side setup. But outside of that, there was a pretty solid area of prior support that hasn't yet been tested as resistance. It's like 82 pips higher. Could be a secondary area of resistance potential to follow. Well, let's see what I got on CAD. Ugh. Sorry, not much I can do with that one. I mean, the trend's nice, but, uh, you know, I, I got like, I got like no analysis on levels around this this, uh, this area. So, I mean, if, if if I was looking on the short side, I would just feel like I'm, you know, praying on hope. If I look on the long side, I would basically just be, you know, trying to throw a dagger at the board, hoping that it sticks. All right, nothing on CAD key. And two commodity pairs, so it's, you know, similarly ugly. Uh, but yeah, that pound key, there's a, there's a trend in there, and it, it may have some trend continuation potential. Uh, yeah, definitely, Alessandro. My pleasure to help. Yes, sir. Uh, from Quran, Cable, if looking to place a buy trade at PB around 133, where would you be placing the stop loss, please? I can't go into the stop loss. That gets a little too close to the trade reco. Um, what I could do is offer support and resistance levels, and then you can use those levels. You can use that analysis in your approach however you want. Um, but I can't talk about stops and targets because then it gets a little bit too close to trade reco territory. But here's what I say. So the challenge with the 133 pullback at this point is like if it gives up 120, 120 pips of upside, I'm going to wonder what the hell is wrong. Point blank. Um, but if it does, a couple of different areas that uh, could be investigated for deeper support potential. Okay. So the 3250, 3275 zone. Those prior resistance did a pretty good job of holding the price on the way back up. And 
even offer some support after the breakout. So that would be a, a novel area to be investigating. A little bit deeper around 13195, 13205 is another one. I would look at that as maybe like an S3 type of area. All right, folks, and with that, I got to end it for today. Uh, really appreciate everybody's time. Very, very much so. Uh, I will be back in two weeks for one last webinar of the year. It's December 15th, 1 p.m. Uh, going back to 1 p.m. These have been at 2 p.m. of recent, so it's going to be an hour earlier. Uh, but it will be going down in two weeks, December 15th. And if you have the time, we'd love to see you back in the room. Uh, oh, and as I did promise, uh, I just published an article. It's, or it should be available on the headline. Let me just double check. There we go. Bill's Evening Star on M1. Uh, but it's right there on the homepage. So if you'd like to see a little more color behind these setups, it's right there for you. Uh, but again, thank you so much to everybody for your time. I really do appreciate it and hope to see you back in the room in a couple of weeks. Till then, have a great day. And as usual, happy trading, ladies and gentlemen.